va a llegar el gol del Arsenal Ozil. Marca Mesut Ozil. That is some absolutely world class sitting down there, staying at home, just sitting down. Oh, look, there he goes. He's eaten his fourth sandwich of the day. This is remarkable. This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. Good morning. Good morning. Whoa. Hello? This week. Oh, wow. That was weird. Hello? What happened there? Oh. He... Hello? Oh, wow. This is so bizarre. Oh, I'm on a massive delay. Yeah, and your voice is now about an octave deeper than it should be. This is fucked up. We're going to have to start again. I'm not doing that myself. <laughs> you sound, ca- you yeah, sound okay. kind of drunk. Maybe we should keep this, though. I'm going to use this if as... If it's funny. It is kind of funny, so I'm we'll going to... keep it. Yeah, I'm going to play this as the first intro. Now I'm going to stop, and we'll, we'll try and correct this and start again. Hang on, folks. Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. Take two, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Everything uh, is fine here. <laughs> I mean, we did have that, didn't we? We, we recorded a podcast for the Patreon where yeah. we came out like we were on helium. That's true. I think you had I have to fix it in post. Yeah, I have the original recording, actually. So I'll drop a little bit of that recording in here now. And now yeah. that all my time is here. I kind of need those markers and maybe, to an extent, need those drugs. Yes, I I know exactly what you mean. The trials and tribulations of doing a podcast. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's like, I don't know what it is. It's the equivalent of doing something that's not that technologically difficult, (laughs) but which always presents strange and unusual um, problems which you never think you're going to encounter. So, you know, Mm -hmm. what can we do but just crack on and hope for the best and and see where it takes us. How, how is everything? How's it all going this week for you? It's it's fine. It's grand. Yeah. yeah, same. Thankfully, everyone is well and healthy and, you know, no no issues in uh, here or in the wider family or anything like that. Um, you know, I've got... How long is your lockdown going to go for at the moment? I what, don't it... know. Right. I don't know. I mean, They've we're... put any date on it. No, I mean, the, it keeps getting extended, of course. So I think there's a, a date till, like, the lockdown has been extended to the 5th of May or, or something like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I just... I don't know. You know what? I had this weird, I had a moment the other day. There's a a pub up the road from me. It was a real Alphalos pub and it closed down. And these guys um, have opened up a brewery in the back of it. It's called Four Provinces. And they make, you know, craft beer, one of those new craft beer breweries. And they took over the pub. They reopened the pub. And, you know, it's taken them about a year to get it up and running um, and and to build the business and, and everything else. And, of course, it's closed down now. But the brewery is still going. And they put something on social media the other day to say, look, if you're looking for a few beers, you know, we can we can um, sell you a case of cans and we'll deliver it to you, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, support a local business and get beer seems sure. pretty decent to me. So I, I said, you know, drop them a message and they came around on Friday to uh, deliver a case of beer, which they did. I just said to the guy, you know, um, you know, you're back to work in the brewery, but like any any word, any advice on pubs and, you know, when you might be able to open again? And he said... Yeah, we're sort of being told maybe September. Right. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I mean, it's not that, yeah. you know, being in the pub is the be-all and end-all or anything like that, but but it's just this sort of realisation that we're in April and they're maybe thinking about September for, for just opening the pub again. Um, and, and, of course, look, pubs aren't the most important thing, but by extension, that means lots of other businesses and places where people go and congregate are going to be closed for, for that length of time. So that kind of mm. hammers it home to you, you know? Yeah, I mean, in fact, I think some of the tabloids today in England or Britain are, are running with the story that the pubs will be one of the last things mm. to reopen. That's I exactly guess- what the guy said. He said... Um, you know, they're being told that it could be schools and pubs are among the last things to, to reopen. Yeah, I guess it's just very hard to enforce distancing in mm. an environment like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, such an odd 
time and everyone's kind of trying to timetable the future. Yeah. Um, but it's really difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So how's it been going with you? Anything strange? What are you doing to pass the time and to keep yourself occupied? I mean, you know, I, I'm very fortunate in some ways in that most of the work I had on is sort of largely continuing. Obviously, mm. I was due to be filming soon. That's all been put back or shelved. Oh, the horrible histories or... So- yeah, yeah, I was due to start shooting May 25th, which obviously isn't going to happen. Mm. Um, but it's really fascinating, actually, sort of trying to figure out when that can happen. And there are so many hurdles to jump through and different issues with, yeah, I mean, health and security and all kinds of problems. We're going to run out of TV shows and movies. Well, this is it. We are. I mean, that they they slowed EastEnders down. They slowed the soaps down in the UK because they were like they went from like four or five episodes a week to two to sort of string it out. Right. Sooner or later, the soaps are going to run out, and then what happens? Then what happens? How then are we going to? It's co- just the news, and what? that's more depressing than anything. Oh my god! Yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, we are. If if things don't kick off again, we're just going to be watching repeats over and over the same shows over and over again. I know, I know. But uh, have you watched any of the telly that's kind of like lockdown TV? Where, you know, for example, Have I Got News For You? They filmed it in isolation. Have you seen any of that? No, no. I mean... I, I haven't either. Really. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of... You know, it's so prevalent, it's everywhere on the news that I don't necessarily want to be reminded of it. You know what? I, I've tried to watch a couple of clips of... What's... Uh, John Oliver? Um, oh, yeah. And I've watched... A couple of clips of the who's the English John Oliver guy, Nish Kumar. Uh, Nish. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Nish Kumar. Right, and you know they're very funny guys, very clever guys, and what they do is 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 really excellent. But without the audience, without it's the tough. sort of it's uh, like it's got to be really tough for them. But it mm. makes it such a strange viewing experience, doesn't it? Because you know they're 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 throwing out these lines and they're funny lines or they're they're witty or they're acerbic, and you kind of feel like they're not landing anywhere because there's no reaction to them. Which mm. you know is is it, I guess it's odd. Maybe just we'll get used to it or or what have you. But it is weird. Mm. It is weird. I mean, the time is ripe for me. Surely, as a comedian used to performing to no laughs. I should be front and centre of this new TV campaign. Exactly. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been you waiting for this moment. I've been practising for it for 10 years. Talking so. to yourself, making videos, <laughs> interacting with yourself. You don't need an audience. Maybe you could yeah. invent your own uh, um, studio audience. Yeah, Laughing true. hysterically at your own gags and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Like... Uh, like in The King of Comedy, uh, Robert mm. De Niro, he hears all the laughter in his head. Scary, yeah. but it could happen. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just doing the same stuff as everyone else. Bits of work, bits of writing, watching telly, yeah. playing some video games. Yeah. No no big change. No big change. We didn't get to play our FIFA tournament. Ah, um, yes. That was shelved. That was shelved. Uh, even the fake football got cancelled, <laughs> but... <laughs> We will try again. Will we? What what night is good for you this week? Tell me. Oh, I mean, this week it's a free for all. I think any any time. Maybe. Okay, let's let's say sort tomorrow night, late. will we? Okay, yeah. We'll fine. We say tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Like the people can get prepared. You know, they can build themselves up for this extravaganza of of video game skill and 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 everything else. So uh, we were so going to Tuesday do- night. That is, unless you, in case you're listening to this Tuesday morning. Yeah, we mean Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday night, nine p.m. We'll go with that. And I think we were going to do Arsenal versus Arsenal. Republic of Ireland versus England, which I'm slightly scared of. Yeah, it's not a great Republic of Ireland team on FIFA. It, I have actually played with them, and pff, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, I don't even know who's in the squad. It's uh, kind of like Robbie Brady uh, and Glenn Whelan, and Glenn I think Whelan. that's kind of it. Okay, here's uh, the Republic of Ireland squad. Um, it's the strikers that threw me. I had no idea who they were. In my head, it's still Kevin Doyle and Shane Long. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Robbie Keane. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I mean, Harry Arter. Well, Shane Long is still there, and he's got Shane 80 Long's pace. He's probably the quickest Irishman in the in the squad. That's what you want. Callum Robinson was the one who I didn't know who he was. He plays uh, for West Brom, apparently. Right. He's got 85 pace. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's all right, actually. Mm. 
Yeah, okay. Look, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. We'll I feel like it could long be... over the top. Yeah, 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 exactly. For these guys to chase onto. S- yeah, set pieces all on the head of Shane Duffy. Telling you, that's how we're going to yeah. do it. That's Everything goes through Jeff Hendrick. Duffy Crazy versus Maguire. Time. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> what a feast. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. And then what was the third match we were going to play? We were going to let the people in the YouTube comments decide, make some suggestions, and maybe we'll pick them at random. Or if there's a really good suggestion, we could, we could uh, you know, take it from there and just okay. see. You know, okay. let's go with the flow. I mean, you know, we don't have anything better to be doing with our lives. So Sure, sure. So, um, yeah. And, that, and that's it for the Arscast this week. Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> Stay safe. All the best. Take your medicine. <laughs> um, what, what football news is there, if any? I mean, still no football. Still, still no, no football. football anytime soon. No. Um, has there been any football news? I mean, there is the news that the Arsenal players have agreed to take a, a wage cut mm-hmm. um you know after all the toing and froing um when it comes down to it i think it was quite a, an interesting point that if and when this thing is signed off and becomes uh official because i guess there's a fair amount of um contractual uh stuff to get through legal stuff and everything else to make yeah. this happen they're going to have to sign either uh, what what do you call it a, a contract amendments or whatever it might be mm-hmm. um arsenal and arsenal's players will become the first to take a pay cut in the yeah. premier league so it is, it is i mean there are hoops to jump through as you say as i understand it nothing is signed as yet and it wouldn't surprise me knowing football and knowing the way people work in football if there were one or two wrangles, maybe, mm-hmm. at that late stage sure. with some of the wording and things like that. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not one, jumping one through thi- that hoop. That hoop no. is... That's, that's, that's an irredeemable I hoop. I agreed. I'm- I know I agreed. I know I voted to jump through the hoop. But now that the, the hoop is presented to me... I don't feel... I feel slightly yeah. reticent. I'm not about, comfortable. I'm not comfortable yeah. with that hoop. You know, the hoop is I looking at me in a funny way. quite wh- wh- whose hoop it would be. <laughs> But I, uh, I, yeah, I'm sure that once Raoul and company present the team with the, well, say show them their tunnel area, they'll plunge into it a whole heart. Yes, they can all jump through Raoul's hoop. And and the executives that emerged during the week had taken a hefty pay cut themselves. Yes, I did like the way that that was worded in the statement yeah. that it came from. Earlier this month, our executives agreed to take a thirty percent cut. Oh, did they? Earlier this month, eh? Like how <laughs> how much earlier was it? Like yeah. the first of April? The minute it happened, was it like oh, let's take a pay cut, or was it just slightly earlier than the footballers not taking a pay cut so you could make yourselves look good? Far be it for I, me to be that cynical or anything, James. But I think you know. yeah. Yeah, no, I think you might be onto something. There, but <laughs> it, it was, uh, yeah, very interesting wording. But listen, I mean, 30%, you know, that is a sizable amount in fairness. I'd be interested to know quite the specifics of how that yes. works, but yeah. we won't ever know that. No, I don't know. It did say they were going to waive 30% of their salary. So what does that mean? Does it mean that they get it back later? Or are they, you know, is it going back into the coffers to pay, you know, the guy in the post room who delivers the letters around Highbury House? I presume they have somebody. Post room Mick. Post room Mick. He's a club legend. I'm actually writing a big feature on him for the, for the athletic. athletic. yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're interviewing <laughs> interviewing the doctor who, who, yeah. who brought him into this world via the birth canal of his mother, Postmistress, Mick. Um, Um, No, yeah, I mean, look, we'll see when it's announced. I think with anything like this, you're kind of, you know, it's too, you you don't want to jump on it too quickly because until it's signed and sealed. I mean, I don't know if you saw the line, which I believe to be true, about the very hefty bonus that would come with winning the Champions League. (laughs) I have to say that made me laugh. It really did. Like, it's a £500,000 bonus, which, of course, is, um, you know, not an insignificant amount of money, right? It, mm. I mean, it's not. But I would say that if you were an Arsenal player and you uh, were part of a team that won the Champions League for Arsenal for the first time in its history, you know, I think I think a bigger bonus could be... Could be uh, merited there you know it's it's what is it it's like a week's wages and a bit for Mesut Ozil that's all that is you know uh, I mean uh, I mean it's a lot for Saka it's a lot for Saka I mean it's like yeah. you know 
10 years of, of hard labour for Bukayo Saka as things stand. I, I mean, I, I mainly laugh because I, <laughs> because I don't really consider it a uh, particularly realistic no prospect. No, uh, no, no, you know they might as well have offered them the moon on a stick. Do you know what I mean? I mean it, it, it ain't happening. Mm. But uh, yeah, an interesting sort of sidebar to the discussion. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's it's. Look, I think ultimately it's definitely the right thing for the players to forgo some earnings in this period, as long as it's on on the right terms. And I think that you know I think that's sort of what we said last week, mm. really. Um, but yeah, it is kind of amazing as well to watch this happening, not just at our club, but across football and try and think yeah. what those implications are going to be. Yeah, exactly. When you think about the, the sort of revenue streams that are now gone in terms of season tickets not mm. being renewed, because how can you renew season tickets when there are no, uh, there is no season to renew for, as far as we know, not yet anyway. And then there's uh, whatever, the commercial revenue, the TV revenue, the, the, the gate revenue, you know, match day revenue, uh, you know, merchandise, all the ancillary revenue streams that are gone. It's going to be really interesting to see. Actually, I had a question. We might as well throw some questions in. And before just we get to this question, can we just like take a moment to give some uh, kudos to, to Mikel Arteta, who apparently was... Um, instrumental in sort of bringing the squad together because, it, you know, it was really a delicate situation. It felt to me like if it wasn't handled properly, this is something that could very well have caused friction between not all the players, but some of the players and the club at a time where mm. we really didn't need that. And also, you know, some kudos for Hector Bellerin as well for being the, you know, the guy who was front and center at this. Um, does, it, does it say anything to you that he was the man at the forefront of it rather than Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who, you know, is the club captain and, you know, traditionally the the the, the guy with the title and the, the figure, the figurehead, you know, who yeah. would be at, at the uh, at the centre of negotiations like this on behalf of the squad. Like, you know, if this had happened in the Tony Adams era, you know, Tony Adams would be there, Patrick Vieira would be there. And I'm not saying this to be in any way critical of Aubameyang. I just think it's an interesting thing that um, that Bellerin was the guy. Yeah, and I think people have different characters and different natures and there are different kinds of leaders. And I think Bellerin, you know, obviously we know about how eloquent he can be and how engaged he is with, you know, the broader political spectrum um, and how engaged he is with current affairs. And I think that will have all helped him in this. Also the fact that he's been in English football for... I mean, nearly a decade now, mm. I would think. He came here at 15. He's been at Arsenal you know, coming on for a decade. Uh, so I think he has that kind of longevity and that association affiliation with English football to be that guy. But from what from what we understand, he has done a really terrific job because this was a, you know, when this was first put to the Arsenal squad, you know, it was very divided on this issue. We're talking sort of, you know, 52, 48, kind of Brexit sort of proportions of uncertainty about what they were going to do here. And it's been a... It's been a substantial negotiation and discussion to get them to the point where they've got a considerable mm. majority. And yeah, Arteta's been a big part of that. But I think Bellerin's also handled it pretty skillfully. And I, I suppose, you know, something we've heard a lot of managers say is you don't have to have the armband to be a leader. But I think he is clearly mm. demonstrating that in this period. Mm. Well, you know, um, would it say anything to you about the potential future of Aubameyang? Or That's is that a, really a separate good point. thing? That's a really good point and not one I had thought of. Um, I mean, look, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about Aubameyang's future. If anything, uh, you know, he's missing... He hasn't got that long left in his career and he's missing a substantial period of football now. Mm. I kind of think if you had it in your mind that you might want to go and play somewhere else, that being forced to miss, you know, six months of football or whatever it might be would accelerate that desire. Yeah. Um, that would be the way I would perceive it. Uh, th I suppose the other side of the coin is it might be more difficult for players to move in this football. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, look, um, it just, it just occurred yeah, to me, it might, be, point, it might be a case that, you know, um, 
yeah, maybe I don't want to go down that road. I, do, I was just thinking, you know, from a financial point of view and players' willingness to, to take cuts and, and those kind of things. But well, I don't want to sort of make any implications in there because it's just no. a, a half-formed thought in my head. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting as well just because, you know, we know from things that have come out of the meetings that um, the few, what happened to the wages of people who left the club was on the table as a discussion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In terms of, like, if it was to be deferrals, would they get that money back? Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah. Well, look, here was the question um, that, uh, that occurred to me or, or popped up. Uh, it comes from Tosh on Twitter, who's at Tabatson. Uh, and he says, do you think we will see other potential takeovers as the one proposed for Newcastle in the near future? What does it mean for us in the future? And uh, a question that came in on the Discord as well from Liney, who said there was a good question asked on the Arsenal Vision podcast last week relating to how guys would feel or how the guys would feel about Arsenal being purchased by a Middle Eastern billionaire. And of course, it's the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, isn't it, that, that's buying up Newcastle. Uh, without wanting to recycle that talking point, I was just wondering how you would both react should it ever happen to us like it may be happening to Newcastle. It just occurred to me, you know, that um, the idea of Stan Kroenke ever selling Arsenal, um, you know, it seemed fanciful because, uh, yeah. you know, he doesn't do that. We know that he doesn't part ways with his sports franchises in inverted commas, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that Josh has become much more involved and much more on the ground at Arsenal. It seems like, you know, he's he's the guy who is, you know, he's KSE's man at Arsenal. You know, Stan is top of the pile, but Josh is the Josh is the uh, the Arsenal guy in that in that setup. But you know there is uh, he has a number of other sports teams to look after, and they're all suffering from uh, this downturn and this lockdown and the lack of revenue. On top of that, his stadium that he was building in L.A. Um, it, as far as I know was originally budgeted to cost $2 billion, which is a huge amount of money. Mm. Um, but as far as like I, me- I remember, um, is it now estimated to cost somewhere in the region of $6 billion? Right. Um, and can he sustain his interest in all of these um, outlets I mean, $6 billion for a stadium, and that was before any of this was going down. Now there's going to be no live events and mass gatherings in in L.A. until 2021, it seems. That was what the mayor of L.A. said last week. You know, how much more is it going to cost him, you know, to, to, to have this sort of gigantic white elephant of a stadium sitting there? Um, so, yeah, there you are, a really roundabout way of saying, what, what do you think is going to happen with us, if anything? <laughs> Well, I suppose the issue is, um, even if Stan became more amenable to the idea of selling, how many people will be in a position or willing to buy at that point and mm. make such a massive investment? Uh, you know, I mean, sure, the Saudi, the Saudi guys probably can because they're, the wealth is so extraordinary that they're not invulnerable against a, an economic crisis like this, but certainly better protected than most. But I'm not sure how true that will be. For other people, um, I, I guess technically, I guess he will be more vulnerable to a, a bid than he has been previously. It's just, it's difficult to imagine, isn't it? Because KFC have never sold a franchise. Did you say KFC? <laughs> I think you did. And they they do operate on a franchise model, actually. <laughs> they do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so could the Zinger Tower come tumbling down? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, uh, let's hope, yeah, that our colonel sells up soon. I, I, I'm i not so sure that too many people will be willing to spend what it would take to buy Arsenal in this period. Yeah, but I mean, could the value of Arsenal be much lower than it might have been in normal circumstances? Perhaps. You know, not just Arsenal, of course, every other football club. Like if we're talking about, you know, the transfer market not operating in the same way, like a, a 60 million player becomes a 30 million player you know, and even that seems a stretch to me at times. Um, you know, I, I, I think the Cronkies have always said that they're long term investors, and I think mm. if you make a long term investment, you don't sell when the asset is at its weakest. Do you know what I mean? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I get it, but I just wonder. 
I, I think yeah. there will be, maybe not at Arsenal, but I think there will be opportunities for those people who do have vast amounts of wealth who probably aren't going to be affected by this uh, as significantly as, as others. There are always going to be very rich people and there are always going to be opportunists and there are always going to be people ready to take advantage of an economic downturn for one person um, you know, by virtue of their own wealth. So maybe it won't mm. be Arsenal, but I do think there may well be uh, a number of football clubs who either go to the wall or will require an owner like that. And I suppose, you know, we, we think about maybe football becoming better and cleaner and, you know, more honest and, you know, uh, all the other good things we can think of um, when this is over because we'll have learned lessons and we'll say, well, that's not the way to run any industry or any operation. Maybe we should focus on, you know, doing things the right way, but maybe the reality of it is that, because of the kind of people who will be able to to spend money and purchase football clubs and run football clubs, maybe it could be worse. Maybe there maybe there are worse people out there uh, than than I, I, there are right now. I suspect that may be the case. And I mean, the Saudi question of sort of how would I feel about it happening at Arsenal is a really tricky one, and one that we've sort of you know we've all had to contemplate ethical questions about the ownership of the club in the last 15 years or so, for various different reasons. Um, I basically think that if you're going to watch and enjoy the Premier League as a product at this point, a degree of sort of cognitive dissonance is almost required. Yeah. Um, because, you know, there are some ugly elements to kind of the business side and you sort of are required to be able to accept that or put that aside almost in order to engage with the sport. Mm. Um which is unfortunate, but that is kind of the way it is. And I suspect in the event of such a takeover, that would be the case. I mean, I, I have given the uh, KSE as you know a tough old time as much as anybody. But when you do look at some of the options out there, I think from a kind of ethical perspective, there are, there are things about them that are preferable. And I know that for many Arsenal fans won't stomach that opinion. But yeah. I do think at least they're... At least... And at least their business is sport to an extent. Like, yeah, the worst thing about them is they don't really know a lot about football. That's kind of the worst thing about them. But yeah, that's not that's not that bad. At least they're not chopping up journalists. Well, there's that. Not yet, though. I mean, who knows? They're not happy with me, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I <laughs> um, but no, exactly that, exactly that, and. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll all learn to be a bit more kind to each other after this. Maybe once once the lockdown's over, I'll run and embrace Stan and we'll have a little kiss and a cuddle. You never know. With, with tongue or...? <laughs> I don't know. The moustache yeah. puts me off. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Um, OK, well, seeing as we're talking about cognitive dissonance and sure. <laughs> uh, things like that... Um, here is a question uh, from Adam Austin, who's at Adam underscore MA94. And he says, good morning, fellas. Good morning, Adam. He says, you're given the chance to rename the Emirates, hence the uh, reference to cognitive dissonance, because, you know, if you're going to be critical of the Saudis taking over it and Newcastle, sure. you have to accept the fact that our our um, our sponsor, our main sponsor and stadium name, etc., is, you know, has some associations that aren't that pleasant. Um, he says, do you go for... Ashburton Grove or New Highbury or any other names you can think of, really. What would you, you know, if you, if I came to you tomorrow, having um, used my sovereign wealth fund to <laughs> chop up lots of journalists and then buy Arsenal, Stan and Josh are out. They're homeless. They're on the side of the road. Mm. Sorry about you guys. You had your chance. You fucked it up. I'm in and I'm, I'm turning to you my trusted podcast partner, and I'm saying sure. to you, James, we need a new name for the stadium. What's it going to be? Um, I'm already about- worried. I'm already worried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, it's uh, it's two years to the day since uh, Arsene Wenger announced his, he was leaving. And I have to say, what about something? I mean, this is silly, but the Wenger Bowl. The Wenger, Wenger Bowl. Bowl? Wenger, Wenger Dome? Bowl at the Wenger Bowl. The Venger Dome, the, the Venger Dome, Dome three thousand. I, <laughs> um, the Nike Stadium. I, I mean, um, the Adidas Arena. Uh, it's a really good question. I saw this question too. 
I was convinced the stadium would be sort of referred to as Ashburton Grove. I thought, yeah, they'll call it the Emirates Stadium, but that won't stick. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I remember quite clearly not writing the Emirates for years and years yeah, on the blog. Yeah, it shows yeah. that if you keep hammering something hard enough, people will accept it. I mean, yeah, it, there was a long period where it was referred to as Ashburton Grove and then it kind of that kind of died away. It would feel almost weird to go back to that in some respects. Mm. It's interesting because some clubs have these commercial agreements, um, but it, but their, their stadiums are still called the same thing. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. like, is, is Bournemouth Stadium, um, is it Dean Court? Yeah, but... But it's the vitality, right? But but mm. I'm sure their fans still call it Dean Court because it was Dean Court for a long time. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, that's the thing when we move from Highbury because it's sort of like Highbury, Old Trafford, Anfield. You know, the 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 name of the stadium stuck, and well before any naming rights or anything like that. I think it's very mm. difficult to go back to it. I mean, it is referred to as the Arsenal Stadium when we're playing in Europe because for whatever reason they don't take into account or they don't allow stadium naming or, or, oh, or really? brand name. Yeah. So if you look at, like, if you download one of the UEFA match kits, press kits, you know, that you can get from the UEFA website ahead of a European game and it says blah, blah, blah at the Arsenal Stadium. It doesn't say the Emirates Stadium. So. Mm. I mean, what like, I always think that the name of the club shop is quite cool, right? The Armoury. I think mm. that makes loads of sense. It fits with like the idea of Arsenal and it's got those kind of military connotations. So is there a name for the stadium that would like fit that identity? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'm desperately trying to think of terms associated with artillery. <laughs> um. uh, but I can't really. I mean, obviously you don't want to call it, you know... The ammunition the, dump. The, yeah. <laughs> The battle zone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no man's land. Um, <laughs> That's the yeah. Unai Emery years. It was known as that. <laughs> you know, the midfield kind of was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, something along that theme would be quite cool. I mean, New Highbury has a certain appeal because it's so close to Highbury. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's such proximity that I don't think it would be... It wouldn't be like insanely cheeky to but I wonder if it no it wouldn't slightly, I don't would it take anything away from Highbury if you were to call it new Highbury no I don't think so mm. I, I, I'm sort of uh, I'm inclined towards that if I can't think of something cleverer what about you I don't know I mean it's difficult it is difficult I mean why in all our years James have mm. Arsenal never been sponsored by Canon? It's a great question, isn't it? What's going on, marketers, marketeers, marketing department, Canon's marketing department? Think of the fucking things you could do. Uh, absolutely. It's just I ridiculous. Agree. What an opportunity missed for cameras and us. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, Canon needs to put their hands in their pockets. The Canon Dome. I mean, Arsenal Stadium Ars Cannon is boring. Arsenal Cannon Grove. I believe Highbury was officially called Arsenal Stadium. It I was, believe. yeah. Um, so it just shows, you know, you don't have to be called what you're officially called. It, it's weird, though, isn't it? Because it's always been the Emirates. How long has it been now? 15 years? Yeah, 2000 is coming up on 2020, 2006, 14, coming up 15 years, yeah. It will be very weird if and when it changes. That's for sure. What if you just gave it, like, a person's name? Like, you know, if a... a the Wenger Dome. <laughs> no, but I had a guy that I used to work with, and his dog was called John. Right. So just give it a person's name. John. John or Trevor. Well, you go and see John. Yeah. Uh, how was John? Uh, quiet today. Yeah, 60,000 people quiet. inside John. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> could happen. Could, could happen. happen. Uh, in the far reaches of the internet, could happen. I, I mean, yeah, Stadium I McStadium, me face. That would be quite good. Mm. I think, I think, 
Yeah, uh, New Highbury or Stadium at Stadium first for me. Yeah, all right. Um, what time did we start? Is this the end of part one or is it? I not? think this I've... could be the end of part one because we've done about thirty three minutes. All right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it could be, yeah, a good time because we've exhausted this um, subject uh, absolutely. So I, I think we should take a break, um, and we'll come back and we'll do more questions in part two. Yeah, right after this. Is what well, you normally I, say. That's what I say. That's what I say. You're stealing my lines, man. Go on then. Right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two where we answer questions that you send to us on Twitter at GunnarBlog and at Arsblog on the Arsblog Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Arsblog and also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. James, you can go first with the questions because you you bigged it up in the in the all-fair chat. You said you got a big one. So, you know, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's see what it now is. I've got to, now I've got to get it out. Show everyone. Uh, <laughs> this is so. Basically, sometimes we get asked questions that are so broad and so massive that I'm like, we n- have not got time for that on the Ask Us Extra. But given that we have nothing else to talk about, right. <laughs> the rules are slightly different this time. So this is from Facebook, and it's from uh, Toye Ade, and Toye says, "Hi, gents. Today marks two years since the announcement of Wenger's soft dismissal. Right, that's his intro, and then his question is, right." What have you made of the club since then? Whoa. <laughs> um, Go. Well. Uh, <laughs> no, I know it's think. massive, isn't it? But, but it, it is, it is um, two years. Does it seem, it seems longer than that to me, you know, in a funny sort of way. It kind of does, yeah. But I think that's because the Unai Emery years took 17 years to happen. Of everyone's life. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, what have I made of the club since then? I mean, it's weird because I've I've gone from being enthused by things to terrified by things to sort of mm. being, okay, yeah, that's good. I like the way we're doing that to like, oh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, I don't know about that. And then like I was in a very dark place a few months ago with everything in a very, very, very dark place. And I haven't forgotten. Mm. I haven't forgotten why, uh, you know, how we got there and the people that were involved in that. I get accused of being a bit too uh, bit too negative towards a certain Danny DeVito, <laughs> who, who could be our head of football or something. Um, and now I'm enthused again. And, you know, so what have I made of the club since the Wenger, what did he call it? Soft dismissal. Soft um, dismissal, yeah. Look, there was always going to be a period of of flux and change and and all that kind of stuff, and we were going to have to do things in a different way and, you know, modernise the structures of the club because you're not going to have, and as we said many times before, you're not going to have that one guy at a football club anymore who, who, who manages everything, who is responsible for everything or feels responsible for everything um, in the way that he operates. So you're always going to have to you know, get a head of recruitment. You're going to have to get a, a director of football or a sporting director or whatever that might be. You know, those structures are going to have to be put in place. You know, here's the thing about it is that, you know, the Emery thing didn't work out, right? It didn't work out, and that happens in football, at football clubs the world over. They bring in a manager, he's the wrong guy, it doesn't work out, he gets fired, they go again. But I do feel like sometimes the the executive side of a football club is allowed to make mistake after mistake after mistake or, or to, to sort of make decisions on on things which reflect badly on them, but they don't get the same scrutiny or they're not, as easily dismissible as a manager. Do you yes. know what I mean? So I, if, if it's going to take us like, look, I, I hope Mikel Arteta works out really well and I'm hugely positive about him and I really like him and I like the way he talks and I like the way he gets the club and I think, like most people, I'm very optimistic about what he will be able to do as a manager at this football club because I think we can connect with him and resonate with him, right? But let's imagine that... Uh, the guy who came after Unai Emery didn't quite work out, which could happen. And the guy that came after that didn't quite work out, which can happen, right? Why isn't the same thing true of executives? That if you if you put in place an executive structure that doesn't quite work, why don't you change executives 
in the same way. I know the jobs maybe aren't quite as expendable as a manager, but yeah. I, I do feel like if it's going to take us a while to get the, the, the thing right, the balance right, you know, in terms of manager and coaching staff, you know, why, why doesn't the same apply higher up? Well, is it just that the timescales are different? Because theoretically, the executives exist to sort of provide a, a, at least a midterm, possibly a long term mm. vision for a club. You know, that, and, mm. and, it, and you need, you know, this is kind of, you know, uh, what's it called when you're sort of making the devil's. Devil's advocate? Devil's advocate, that's it. Devil's avocado. Yeah, exactly. The devil's avocado. I'm having the devil's avocado now. Um, I guess in an ideal situation, you do want somebody to provide some measure of continuity. Uh, and, and I guess, do they have to be allowed to get it wrong, at, you know, at least one, at least once? Or is it like you had hired the wrong manager one time, done? Mm. Mm. You know? Yeah, OK. No, I get that. That's fair. That's... That's a, a good counter argument to that. Um, what have I made but, of the club, though? Can we go yeah. back to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think I was prepared for some fluctuations in our performance mm -hmm. when somebody like Wenger left. You know, we'd already been enduring fluctuations in performance on the pitch, um, so I was prepared for for things not to go smoothly right from the very start. And, they, they, you know, I think what's lost in the mists of time is that even though Emery really wasn't too many people's first choice uh, as manager, right? No. Uh, there was, I think, a groundswell of support for him because we wanted him to do a good job. Mm. You know, I think there was you know, um, support for him, even when things weren't going that well. Um, you know, the 22 Most game on beat run. Positives, yeah, we looked for they? the positives. We tried until, for me anyway, it became blindingly obvious that this was a, you know, he was a problem. Mm. Uh, and that was, that was evident uh, by the end of his first season. So where I went to a dark place was the, the way that things were handled. Um, when this season went bad and, and yeah, I, yeah. I feel like the people who are running the club completely misjudged the mood. They misjudged the sentiment of the fans. They misjudged or were unwilling. They were either unwilling to accept the fact that Emery was doing a terrible job or didn't think he was doing a terrible job. I'm not sure which is worse. Mm. You know, the, 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 the sort of pushback against some of the fan sentiment with some of the stuff that was leaked, you know, the, you know, what was the, the phrase, noise. the noise, that kind of stuff. It was just like, come on, you know, how are you getting this so badly wrong? And then, you know, putting Freddie in charge with, you know, per Mertesacker and, and, uh, the, th the goalkeeping coach. And that was all the staff that they gave him. And, you know, that whole thing was really badly handled. So for me, while I'm hugely optimistic about Arteta, and what he can do, that has put a massive dent in the faith that I had or have in those on high because I feel like those mistakes and the way that those things were handled was so egregiously bad that you can't help but be um, slightly scarred by them. Do you ever see a fucking dog that's been beaten its whole life and somebody puts their hand down to to pat the dog and he kind of cowers away? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, a bit, a bit like that. Like, I'm not mm. going to forget where we were and how bad it was because while we might forget, um, you know, the support that Emery got, I do wonder if sort of Arteta coming in and wiping things clean a little bit has made people forget just how, how bad it was when Emery eventually got fired. Well, also, I mean, the, the crisis that we're going through at the moment, it, it, you know, probably does probably does the club a little bit of a favour in that it puts some distance, doesn't it, between mm. that low point and whenever football restarts. Um, and I suspect that there'll be such uh, anticipation and excitement about football coming back that, that those things will be slightly forgotten. Mm. Um, I'm not forgetting.
No, not by everybody, no. clearly. No. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I, I mean, it's um, it's been really fascinating. I think as much as we all said when Arsene went, oh, it might get worse before it gets better, I think it did get actually quite a lot worse than I thought it would. <laughs> uh, like in the early part of this season, you know, when we were kind of lower half of the table, mm. they, were, they were sort of semi-serious conversations about the relegation zone. Um, that you know that I didn't expect it to get that bad after Arsenal went. That's for sure. Yeah, I thought it would be easier to produce a bit of a turnaround and a bit swifter. I mean, as it planned out, as it panned out rather, I think Emery was kind of a classic successor to a, a long-term legendary manager in some ways. Mm. Like you know, a guy who sort of was kind of the anti Wenger in some respects and didn't really fit, uh, but kind of, I don't know, sort of didn't cost us that much either. Mm. I mean, you could say it cost us Champions League qualification partly, but uh, I sort of think it wasn't a great spe- a period of time and, you know, it sort of was a period of enormous turnover. It feels like Arteta's the actual yeah. start of something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a, a very, very odd couple of years I mean particularly I think when I reflect on our transfer windows you know we're talking about forthcoming transfer windows and how I saw a good quote Damien Camoli this morning was saying that he'd been told by an agent there are three Premier League clubs who will be able to spend money in the next transfer window so, and I can tell you now Arsenal ain't going to be one of them so that's Man City Chelsea yeah. Newcastle yeah. Newcastle possibly Maybe. yeah um so, you know, that that's kind of fascinating. But in the last two, we actually had, you know, a decent amount of money. I mean, in in last summer's transfer window, we spent, well, well over a £100 million, wasn't it? £140 million, something like that. I know we sold uh, Alex Awobi, et cetera, too. But yeah. we spent a good chunk of money and we probably won't ever be able to do something like that again for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also assessing that business is is fascinating because on the day it was all done, we were all really chuffed with it. But as the season played out, maybe less so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. Um, that's the thing about transfers. When they happen, you immediately want to, um, you know, think the best of the players that you're bringing in. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, ooh, I never heard of this El Nenny guy. I'm sure he's great. He's going to be like top player, you know, <laughs> uncovered another bargain here. And then you just realize, well, he's just a kind of a an average player. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, being enthused about um, transfer business when it happens versus being, uh, what's the word, quizzical or, or questioning that business down the line when we've actually seen the players and what they've produced on the pitch – I think it was, you know, are reasonable positions to take in both instances. You can be happy that you've signed someone and then a little bit down the way when you see them play or you, you make, a, you make a, a judgment on the player, you know, based on what he's producing on the pitch versus what he's cost, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, it's okay to use evidence for your mind to change. So, Yeah, I, I suppose w- what's tricky is sort of to what extent do you give an executive leeway for the vagaries of how these things actually play out. So, for example, a manager might look like a logical appointment, but for some reason they don't fit. I'm not Mm. saying Emery fits into that camp because I think there was enough evidence if you knew a lot about him to be concerned about that appointment. But say a signing, you know, say Nicolas Pepe, for example, Mm. I think many Arsenal fans or objective observers would look at that and go, oh, that is a very good signing. And yet... It didn't quite become that in the, his first season. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I, I get it. So, you know, it, it is an interesting one. I would say, just finally on this, because we'll move on and we'll take another yeah. question. Let me ask you a question then, rather than say something myself. I mean, do you think that in the 18 months or so that he has been head of football at Arsenal, mm. Raul Sanyehi would be proudly displaying his CV and his accomplishments to many people? No. I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. But my only thing I would say is he might say, I need more time than that. <laughs> of course. In fact, not he might. 
He yeah, definitely he would. He definitely would. I def- yeah, I definitely need more time. Need more time. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think we've gone forwards particularly. Or, um, you know, to put it another way, we kind of went backwards a lot. Yeah. But, you know, well, or, you know, the decline didn't really... The decline didn't halt. No. With us and leaving, that's for sure. It got, it got temporarily better, but then it became more decliney than ever. Steeper. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's my question. And this Go one on. comes from... Ah, fuck, I had it here and now it's gone. It comes from... For fuck's sake. Uh, oh, I got it here now. From Peter Hust, who's at Peter Hust mm-hmm. on Twitter. And he says, which of Wenger's almost signings were you hoping for the most? Oh, that's a great question. For instance, I was really hoping for Eden Hazard and believed for some time that he would come. Him ending up being really good for a rival kind of sucked. Um, and I know you've done, you did a piece this week for The Athletic mm. on, on more transfers that almost happened, mm. uh, but didn't, uh, yeah, which yeah. I did read, There's but now I can't remember any of them. So I'm just going to go back and look at them while you're talking. <laughs> Uh, it was ones like uh, that piece was ones like Vardy. Oh yeah, Hazard was mentioned. Juan Mata. I think oh, Juan yeah. Mata might be one of the ones that figures really highly for you. Mm. I know how much you wanted us to get him that summer. I remember well. Um, Kante was another one mentioned, and I'd done another piece previously, which was obviously Luis Suarez, Higuain, <laughs> <sighs> a few others, Thomas Lamar, Nuri Sahin. There are plenty with Arsenal. You've got a, a good old wide selection. I mean, different names jump out, out at me. I have to say, I think although we eventually got him and it didn't work out great, the summer we were trying to get Baptista from Sevilla, I was desperate for us to get him. Mm. Absolutely desperate. This was 2006, I believe. Oh, Patrick the beast. Vieira. The beast. The or, form yeah, 2005, of the beast. in fact. Sorry, 2005. Yeah. The La Bestia. Uh, Vieira had gone, I think, to Juventus. And the talk was that Arsenal were going to reshape their midfield around this brilliant goal-scoring Brazilian from La Liga. And I was in Spain most of that summer you know, every day reading was the that Spanish why? sports daily. Was that the only reason you were in Spain for most of the summer? You just <laughs> I mean, went over genuinely. to read the papers. <laughs> I tried to put him in a suitcase and bring him back. <laughs> I, I think I was on holiday, but I was just absolutely... I th- I, you know, when you watch, uh, particularly in these days, you know, there was La Liga was on Sky Sports quite often. I watched quite a lot of it and I just loved Baptista. He was mm. sensational in that team. And I know fans who only saw him at Arsenal might be like, really? Because he, he didn't really ever click with us yeah. apart from one spectacular game. Um, but yeah, I was very, very on board with that and slightly gutted when he went to... Mm. Real Madrid. Uh, but there are others. What, what about you? I'm thinking, you know, there's some which were more public than others. So the Hazard one was really public because, you know, we all knew about it. We knew of our interest in him. And of course, we ended up yeah. getting a, a different player um, from the same club, Gervinho, uh, which mm-hmm. you know, really didn't work out. Um, the, you know, I think about players who might have made a big impact at Arsenal, you know, over, over the Wenger years. And considering our issues in in defence, I do wonder what might have happened if we'd signed Vincent Company a bit earlier mm. than Man City did, because he was certainly a player that we were after. Mm. And here's another one that I'm pretty sure wasn't too public, but we were absolutely 100% on the case of Luka Modric. Oh, yeah. That's um, a really interesting one. When uh, he joined... This is good. This is all good for my part three. You're helping me do the homework on yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. he obviously went from Dinamo Zagreb to, uh, to Tottenham. But that summer, I think it was 2007 or 2008, mm. we were really, really, really close to doing a deal for him. Mm. And... Um, it, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Another one, I think, is uh, Marco Royce. Yeah. God, that used to come up every... Yeah, it's but... It sort of predates Julian Dax, Draxler, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but Wenger was a huge fan of Marco Royce, and we did yeah, make some attempts to uh, 
to bring him in um, a good few summers ago, and maybe it happened more than once, but I know that certainly there was a lot of contact uh, a few summers ago, and that didn't happen. And then you go, you go back to you know stuff like Cristiano Ronaldo and Zlatan, um, you know players who were who were certainly on our radar. You know we were, I mean sure. the, the Ronaldo Messi, story, of course. Yeah. Oh Messi, yeah, we were trying to bring Messi in, you know, at the same time as Fabregas, but because of the work permit thing, we we couldn't do it. Same with Gerard Piquet. Piquet was supposed to come at Fabregas, and he mm-hmm. ended up at at Man United. Um, you know the the Ronaldo story where we had agreed terms with with sporting wasn't it and then yeah united came in and blew us out of the water in terms of a fee you know he'd been to highbury and all that kind of stuff zlatan i don't do trials Uh, i mean look zlatan's the kind of player who would have turned up scored a load of goals and then fucked off and become you know one of those enemy players you know um yeah but i mean there are those young guys are you know they are they are great examples but sometimes you get more short-term things i mean i remember in when Leicester won the league and Arsenal were, you know, in for Vardy and in for Kante, I mean, particularly in the case of Kante, he was a player who seemed like such an obvious antidote to so many of the problems Arsenal had in terms of protecting their back four, you know, in, in the centre of midfield. And, you know, mm. in the piece we go over the reasons it didn't happen and it was all to do with agents' fees and things like that. But, yeah, I think he would have made a, a massive impact. I mean, he went to Chelsea and they won the league that season mm. yeah I mean that was a that was an issue with his agents and stuff wasn't it yeah. or yeah, yeah it was about how much we were going to pay the agents and what have you mm. um, yeah okay uh, let's have another question um, oh on the subject of signings and transfers Kyle on Twitter at Kyle underscore Laurie says it's been a weird welcome to management for Mikel Arteta but has the transfer deal for Cedric now become our most bizarre signing ever? It's certainly going to be up there, isn't it? Because it's, it's going into, yeah, the sort of Kim Chelstrom Hall of Fame, surely. It could be. I mean, it depends what happens. Because, you know, I think, I think the lack of football in some strange way increases his chances of getting a permanent deal to Arsenal because it's easy and convenient. Sure. Right. So I wonder if, you know, the the season had played out as normal, and you know he his his loan spell would have ended. He would have become a free agent. I think there was an easy way for Arsenal to do the deal anyway. But you know, perhaps our league position might have informed things. Perhaps you know if he played a few games and been really really terrible, that would have informed things. Similarly, he could have played a few games and been really really good, and we might have said, yeah, well, this seems like an easy easy way to p- boost the the right back position. I think he will sign a permanent deal with us, um, Mm -hmm. mostly because I think, you know, his agent is is very closely connected to the Arsenal, I don't want to say boardroom because it's not really the board of directors or anything like that. It's, you know, he's very close to Edu, he's obviously very close to Ralph Sanyahi. Hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah, he's close to the the football executives at the club. Uh, You know, he watches games with them in the director's box. So I feel like there's, you know, I I don't want to, again, cast any aspersions or anything like that. Um, But that is another one of those things that makes me slightly wary of of the people who are running the club and and what have you. It's just, you know, that agents, agents, mates, players, you know, it's all a bit too small of a circle, if you like, for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not saying anything untoward is going on. It could all be very much above board, but it may not necessarily be the right way to do your transfer business. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I think given what's happening and given the weird contractual situations that are going on and and the, the uncertainty over whether football will start again and whether the transfer market as we know it is going to operate. I think if there's a, a quick and easy way to sign a right back uh, that we need, are we going to go out scouting and looking around or are we going to get the guy who's been, you know, he's just there. He's there. It's easy to do. So sure. I kind of feel like that will be easy to do. Yeah, so affordable probably. I can't remember what the exact question was, but is it one of the most bizarre? Yeah, it probably is. But I think he will probably become an Arsenal player um, officially. It'll be as long a wait for a debut as I can 
recall. Probably since we signed Theo Walcott, you know, in terms of like a, a player who you expected to play That's a little right, bit. yeah, because he signed in the January, didn't he? He didn't make his and debut didn't until, until the, the following next season. season. Yeah. yeah. With the World Cup in between, of course. Isn't that the most ridiculously bizarre thing you ever heard of? That, that you know, Theo Walcott at 16 years of age joins Arsenal from Southampton, mm. doesn't play a minute for Arsenal, but somehow gets selected for the England World Cup squad way before he was ready to be part of anything like that. It's mad, it, isn't it? It is kind of incredible. Yeah. Uh, Who unbelievable. Was it? That was uh, Sven, Sven Joran Eriksson, yeah. And it was at the expense of Jermaine Defoe, I believe. Um who was sort of, you know, scoring goals in the Premier League an est- and a grown-up. An established professional <laughs> player and a grown-up. He, yeah. he was a grown-up. Yeah. Uh, and he, t- he took the little boy. They took a child. Uh, yeah, they took a child instead. It, it, amazing. Absolutely amazing. I mean, the, 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 the issue with it was, you know, there have been examples of that. I mean, I believe Brazil took the great Ronaldo when he was like 17 to a tournament and he didn't play a minute, but it was sort of, you know, your... You're learning. You're going to be part of this squad in the future. But they had lots of other good options at that time. Mm. England sort of needed that player uh, in the squad and sort of didn't have them. It was pretty incredible. And just looking up the England World Cup squad of 2006. Yeah. Um, Um, So it was probably still... Forwards were... Heskey and Owen, wasn't it? Michael Owen, Wayne Rooney, Peter Crouch... Uh, Peter Crouch. And yeah. Theo Walcott. And I don't think Walcott got on in the tournament. Uh, he played in a couple of the warm-up friendlies for a few minutes, which mm. is the first time that many Arsenal fans saw him play. It's mad. It was properly mad, yeah. Uh. I think Rooney had kind of exploded onto the scene so dramatically not that long before, a couple of years mm. before, that I think there was just kind of an assumption of, like, oh, we've got another one of those now. We got another yeah, one of those yeah. ones, so it was going to be the same. But I mean, Walcott actually made a fairly immediate impact in Arsenal shirt. He set up a, an equaliser on the opening day of the following season for Gilberto that against was Aston Villa. The first game at, at the, the new Emirates. stadium. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I can remember exactly where I was when that goal went in. I was sitting in really? a in a bar in Barcelona. The bar was called Scobies. Um, on Ronda Universidad, I think, is the name of the road. Anyway, just not far from Plaza Catalunya. And I was sitting there and chatting away with two random Arsenal fans who were there, and I was thinking, fucking hell, are we really going to lose the first game at our brand new stadium to a goal scored by Olaf Melberg? Is that what's really going to happen here? Come on, we can't have that. And then Gilberto scored. And I remember the stadium being so brand new and everything else, it didn't have any of the the sort of Arsenal, what did they call it? Arsenal of... Arsenalisation. Arsenalisation. Yeah. Um, it didn't have any of that. So there were these kind of concrete, um, you know, the, the, the rows of the st- uh, stands were sort of just bare concrete and it looked a bit industrial and, and what have you. But uh, yeah, big goal from Gilberto. Big goal from Gilberto. He had a knack in that period, actually. That was sort of around when he was taking penalties for us, I believe. Mm. Um, yeah, what, what was the question? I've forgotten now. Oh, Can't yeah, remember. we're signing ever. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what we were talking about. Uh, what about this from Jonathan Illot? Okay. Is the Saka situation as simple as sign or sell? See, I was thinking, I saw that question, I was thinking about this. Yeah, I don't think it's as simple as sign or sell, but I was thinking to myself, if we can't get Bakayo Saka to sign a new contract, it's an abject failure. In a pandemic. <laughs> it's an abject failure from the people who are running the football club, right? And then I was thinking, it is maybe just slightly complicated by this idea that there's been this big, huge discussion about players taking pay cuts. Yeah. And then we're going to say to Bakayo Saka, well, you're a really good player. We want your future here at Arsenal. You're earning an absolute pittance 
in comparison to what you should be and certainly in relation to what you're, you've produced on the pitch for us. You know, mm-hmm. in terms of your usefulness um, uh, and what you're earning is just is ridiculous. You know, you've mm-hmm. made the step forward. You need to be rewarded for that. How, you know, you're taking a 12.5% pay cut of your three grand a week. Now, here's a new contract on 40 grand a week. You know, how does how does that work? How does that tally with perhaps what it might mean for some of the other players in the squad? Hang on a minute. My wages are being cut and Bukayo Saka, even if I understand it, is getting a 6,000% increase on his salary. Uh, well, in no other business in the world is anyone going to get a pay rise in this period. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But we have no choice if we want to keep Bukayo Saka than to Protect give him... Asset. A yeah. massive pay rise because mm. he deserves it and because by any standards, you know, <laughs> he merits that money, you know, even if football isn't on at the moment, you know, how do you secure, uh, you know, the, a talent like that, a, a guy who could be part of our team for, for years and years to come, you know, he's emerged from our academy, you have to pay him. You cannot just sort of say, well, it's all a bit pandemic-y at the moment, hang on there. You've got to give him the money. So maybe that's what the twelve and a half percent's for to pay it's because the Saka fund. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that must be uh, incredible. I mean he's 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 edging closer and closer to the ed- end of that contract. Mm. But equally, it's sort of very difficult to imagine that the club's immediate priority has been to extend that contract just because they've been firefighting to this point. Yeah. But let me tell you, that is a fire. That is a fire that is burning and raging and needs to be snuffed out. I mean, Arsenal really need to keep Bukayo Saka, especially in some respects, given the fact that if we are thinking, well, transfer fees might be not a thing of the past, but certainly significantly reduced. You know, if, if the choice is sign or sell, well, sell for what? Mm. Sell to who? I mean, what's much more likely is Bukayo Saka runs down his contract and leaves for something approaching a tribunal compensation. Oh. Uh, and look, that look, look, would be horrible. disastrous. Yeah. Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've got no choice. They've got no choice. And I would, you know, I know it's a difficult and complicated situation, but I would, you know, I, I, I you know, as much as I haven't forgotten some of the other stuff, this would be absolutely unforgivable not to, well, not to is, tie down Saka. The, the tricky thing is, if you're Saka's agent... You know, Arsenal can come to you. I think it. I think David Ornstein said the other day it might be five grand that Saka's on. It's not a lot of money either way, but well, it is a lot of money to a lot of people, but not for a Premier League footballer. Yeah. But Arsenal can say we're going to give you a X hundred percent pay rise to I don't know forty grand a week. Let's say right, mm. and his agent can look at that and go, okay. But if if Saka were to leave Arsenal and go to Manchester United or Manchester City, I think they would probably pay him double what Arsenal might offer in that situation. Yeah, they could. I mean, I suppose the the thing to say is that you're you're you have to take into account what the player wants um in terms of, yeah. you know, I think I think this would be a much more difficult discussion or you know for 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 the club to have if there was somebody like Unai Emery in charge whereas i think the players are really into Mikel Arteta and what he does and how mm. he might develop them so i think if you're Saka you're looking at the next few years of your career and you're thinking well you know am i going to go to man united and be coached by Ole Gunnar Solskjaer even if it is more money fuck that who needs mm. that in their life whereas if mm. you're saying i can sign a uh, a contract with Arsenal, which gives me a, a big pay rise, which pays me something approaching what's commensurate with my talent and ability and, and what I'm producing. And no doubt with incentives built into it and pay rises built into it and, you know, year on year pay rises and, you know, all of the various bonus aspects, which could significantly increase his earnings. And at the same time, I'm going to get to work with Mikel Arteta at the club I've grown up at and I can develop as a player and become better as a player under his tutelage, I think that's an attractive package to present True. to to Saka and his agent. You know, sure, he can get more money in lots of places if he runs down his contract. But, 
is it going to be the best thing for him as a, as a player? And maybe that's a kind of rose tinted view of the situation because I really want him to stay. But I think it is a, se- a really big selling point if that's the discussion you're going to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's a fair point. I mean, look, I, I'm desperate for Arsenal to keep him. I think he's a massive part of you know the recent good vibes that have come out of the team and out mm. of the squad and. He's one of the reasons I've got some hope for when the football restarts. So fingers crossed we can you know, pay him what's needed. But it, it is a tricky time to be negotiating a new contract with anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially having gone through this pay cut thing. OK, couple of, let's do a few quickfire ones to finish off yeah. with. Uh, AFC Met, who's at AFC Met, says, if you could go back in time and only keep one of the following players from the relevant years, who would it be? Vieira, 2006. Henri, 2007. Fabregas, uh, 2011. And Robin Van Persie, 2012. That's really tough, actually. Uh Uh-huh. It is. Because, just to explain my thinking, kind of when Vieira left, you know, there was... um, how can I put it? Like, I would have loved to have kept Fabregas or Van Persie because they were kind of keeping those teams afloat, but I'm not sure how sustainable those squads were anyway in that period. Mm. Um, and, and, and you know, Vieira was this absolutely iconic player, but there was a kind of logic in moving him on at that time, especially given he'd been pushing for it. And the same goes for Henri. I think I'm going to say... I think I'm going to say Fabregas. Okay. Just because I feel like he was the heart of that team. And when he left, you know, it left a big, a significant mm. void. So I'm going to say Fabregas. What about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm tempted for Fabregas because I feel like, uh, you know, if we'd put the right players around him and Chabi Alonso and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um but I do wonder what would have happened if we kept Van Persie and added someone like Santi Cazorla uh, as well. True. You know, I know we use the Van Persie money to basically sign um, Giroud, Podolski and, and Cazorla, didn't we, that summer? I mean, they played a big part of it. But I do wonder. Yeah, He was my number two, weirdly. I, I know mm. Vieira and Henri are some of the greatest players in Arsenal's history, but when you look at their age when they went, you know, there was... Uh, and I know Van Persie was no spring chicken either, but there was a kind of logic to it. Van Persie as well, the way in which he left and the team he went to and the impact he had in that season at Old Trafford yeah. was also agonising. So mm. that's a decent shout too, I think. Okay. Um, let's see. What I about this one? Go uh, on. George Stevens. If Mikel Arteta had the voice of Sean Dyche, would you still believe in him? <laughs> That'd be funny. Like same accent or just yeah. I think he's got Spanish uh, accent. I think I think he's I think he's got the accent and the voice. Yeah. See, I don't think Mikel, Mikel Arteta just physically isn't able to produce the that sound accent. that Sean Dyche produces because it, it comes from him being this big gigantic man, you know. Yeah. Whereas yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Arteta's vocal cords just couldn't. Couldn't do it. Couldn't Would I still believe deaths. in him? It's about what they say and not how they say it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Jacob, uh, who's at Orkis Snack 3, says, Could you rate your favourite Swedish players down the years? My favourite is Stefan Schwartz. Stefan Schwartz, really good player. Uh, I did like the fact that he left Arsenal because his wife hated living in London, apparently. <laughs> and then right? he went to he went, Sunderland. Did to, oh, did he go to Sunderland? Right. He went to Sunderland. Did he play for Fiorentina at some point? Stefan Schwartz. I think he did. I might be wrong about that. but Yes, he did after, after oh, us. Oh, he left he us, went, yeah. he, went, he went to Fiorentina, then Valencia, then Sunderland. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he's sort of just as my Arsenal consciousness was sort of forming, so I don't mm. know. Schw- uh, Schwartz and Limpar are players who... You know, I've seen bits of, but not really enough to have a strong opinion mm. on. Uh, but people who watched Anders Limpar really loved him, I think. Yes, I loved Anders Limpar. So there's there's no going beyond Anders Limpar for me. Uh, I really, as in not even Freddie. Oh, 
God, I love Freddie too, though. But there was just something about Limpar that was... I don't know. Maybe it was because of the time that, I, you mm. know, I just really liked watching him. I loved, you know, when he'd take off at a defence and just dribble at them and murder them. I remember him scoring a goal, maybe a few goals, against Leeds that way, which are... Right. Yeah. I just, yeah. I remember being heartbroken when he left. Like, yeah, absolutely I, I, heartbroken. Because I found out by picking up a newspaper and on the back page was Anders Limpar holding up an Everton shirt. And I was like, what the fuck has happened here? Where'd that come from? This was, you know, pre-internet, you, you know. Horrible so, way to find out. Sure I is. I loved Freddie, uh, yeah. particularly, like, in those, his first few years. I thought he was just sensational. You know, red hair, all that. Really loved him. So mm. I'd say him. I mean, I, I, will, I did have a soft spot for... Everyone's favourite Swedish goalkeeper, Rami Shaban. I thought yeah. I really liked uh, Rami. I thought that he, on his few Arsenal appearances, looked pretty decent. But yeah. then he broke his leg, and it all kind of went he wrong. He did, of course. And yeah, he's still on Twitter. You know, yeah, always positive yeah. about the team and uh, and everything else. Big so Arsenal fan. Yeah, yeah. Seb Larsson as well, of course. Seb Larsson, yeah. I, th- I think he's still playing. Um, which. He's 34. Yeah, he plays in Sweden, but he's still with the Swedish national team. He's now got 118 caps. Wow. Wow. Some career, that. Sure yeah. is. Takes a good free kick. Takes a great Takes set Takes a piece. good free kick. Yeah. Okay. Um, here is a question from Rohit M, who's at Rohitster, who says, who's going to come out of the lockdown with the most ridiculous haircut? What, out of me and you? Or not me and you. We don't have haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have hair to have a haircut. And let's not go okay. down the hair replacement therapy line again. Okay. Uh, let's... I haven't had anyone get in touch, by the way, and offered... No, me that, neither. So. I've had no no yeah. offers of free wigs or anything. Unbelievable. Maybe not we like just don't connect... Genius. We, we don't Do connect with the wig... Com- what? Oh, When Bearded Genius got a free hair transplant on Twitter... Because he got I enough remember, retweets. I do remember you telling me about this before. That's yeah. great. Um, who's going to come up with the most ridiculous hair? Well, Arteta's looks in pretty good nick still, doesn't it? Does, yeah. I mean, easily I manageable. Would, I think Ainsley Maitland-Niles needs to grow his back. I don't... Listen, there are some people for whom the shaved head really works. I'm not sure he's one of those people. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not it's, much of a difference to the sort of tight... I know, I know, but just sometimes with some people it doesn't look quite right. I mean, who else is a contender? Maybe if Ganduzi's just let it grow and Louise, you know. If Ganduzi, I haven't seen Ganduzi, I've not seen a picture of him. Louise is all over Instagram. But yeah. Ganduzi might come out looking like Hector's, a wild man. Hector shaved his head. Yeah, yeah. Um, he looks slick as you'd expect. Do you know what I'd, I'd really like to get like a Clippers on the number one? Mm. or zero and just shear a channel right down the center of Ganduzi's head or Louise or anyone right, with that so kind of long hair so they've got sprouting like sprouting from the sides yeah so they've got like two not not even a big baldy head just a big bald stripe down the middle and then like an the t- anti-mohawk yeah exactly an anti-mohawk That'd be amazing. Yeah. I, I, I just love the sensation of doing it, though. Just zzz, like shearing a sheep. Yeah, I think that would... And it would look quite cool. I think they so. They could basically have each half in, like, bunches and then a little <laughs> sort of runway down the middle. Yeah, exactly. One half is, you know, blonde. The other half is green, whatever you can do Starting with your to head. feel a bit sort of Rigobert song at this point. Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Go the whole way. Go the whole way. I think I have one more. Oh, okay, have we got go time on. for one more? I think we've got time for one oh, more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but this is definitely the last one. Uh, it comes from Sochevilia, mm-hmm. at Sochevilia on Twitter. And they say, if you were blindfolded in your home and were told there were three medium-sized turtles let loose, how long do you think it would take you to find them? I would like to know. Ask me again, Andrew. Sorry, turtles. So you're blindfolded and you're told yeah. that there are three medium-sized turtles let loose right. in your home. How long do you think it would take for you to find them? Quite a long time. Because I think turtles, they don't move fast when they're on the land. So I think there's every 
and I to the touch. You know, you might touch one and just think that's an object. It's not like they're furry. Do you know what I mean? They they could be made of it. any wooden object. It's got quite a similar feel, I would imagine. What is this round wooden object with legs and yeah. a head? I wonder yeah. what it could be. I, I, the, the problem is, I've got my house is littered with those. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely covered in them, like fake carved turtles. animals. Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> I've swum with turtles actually, um, I, which is cool. I'm suspicious of turtles. What do you not like about them? It's not that I don't like them. I'd just be a bit suspicious of them. You know, they're they're a bit snappy and stuff. Mm. I didn't sort of do it on purpose. I was kind of swimming, ah, and then right, there okay. were turtles there. I kind of feel yeah. like we should leave them the fuck alone, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You absolutely should. Yeah. You absolutely should. Like, they, they live for ages. And ages. Yeah, they've like, seen some shit. They've seen some serious shit, and that gets passed down through generations. So I think it would take me about... It depends how big your, your house is, doesn't it? I think it would take me about three turtles. I think it would take me hours. Yeah, I, I think it would take me hours. I'd say because you're blindfolded, so you've got to navigate your way around anyway. Mm. You could lose your bearings, and if they're like on the floor, like I don't know if you've ever watched anything where someone is blindfolded or is is in the complete darkness. Like they, I, like uh, on I'm a Celebrity when Ian Wright was on it last year, someone says they had to go in a room that was completely dark and get a gold star out to get a meal for camp, right? Right. And obviously there's the rooms full of not turtles, but like more awful things like snakes and spiders and stuff. Fuck that shit. And they, they could be right by the star, but obviously they miss it. Time and time but again. How, let me ask you, how are they supposed to find it? Or is it just by touch? You're supposed to... By touch. All right, exactly. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the problem is, oh, no, I've touched a snake. Which is kind of the same with the turtles, except you want to touch the animals. I would say I could find them in less than an hour. I'm just thinking about really? it. Really? Yeah. Because I'm going to be blindfolded at the front door. Your dogs aren't allowed to help. Dogs aren't allowed to help. So I'm blindfolded at the front door, and I'm going to do it on your hands and knees. On my hands and knees, exactly. Under the beds. Yeah, I'd, I'd do it in an hour. Because I, I be go quite ups- scary. I go upstairs for it. Yeah, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like it. But I could. I reckon I could do it. Because there's only a like limited number gates, of places they could be, you know? I can't imagine turtles can navigate stairs. That seems like a recipe for disaster. Mm. So there'd have to be little gates on the stairs. <laughs> but I, I, think, uh, I think it would take me hours, I'll be honest. Okay. Okay, well, look. Let's try next week on the uh, yeah, live we'll do, on YouTube. Do it live on YouTube. Anyone who's got three turtles, uh, just send them by post to uh, yeah. Seven Dublin, and uh, you know we'll we'll do the rest. Great. Uh, okay, well, look, we'll leave it there. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you as ever for listening. Thank you for being with us. Do join us tomorrow night uh, on the YouTube. We'll post the links yeah. on Twitter and what have you. We will play FIFA against each other, assuming, of course, that the EA servers aren't bollocks they like they were themselves. last week. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not as if there's sort of a mass of people playing video games all of a sudden that they can't cope with the traffic. I don't know what the story is. But anyway, that'll be there tomorrow. Um, we will have more podcasts and stuff during the week or, or towards the end of the week anyway. We'll do our best to keep you entertained. Uh, thank you as ever, and we will catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>